Well, this is our Go Vols Sunday, so I'm going to put my cap on. And we're going to go ahead and start with our series, hashtag Go Vols. Amen. Go Volunteers. That's what Vols stands for. Vols, that's short for Volunteers. And so the Tennessee Volunteers, how did that name come about? Well, many of you may not know or understand where that name came from. But the Tennessee Volunteers were actually a part of our history here in the state of Tennessee. Uh, the War of 1812, thousands of people from Tennessee volunteered to go fight against the British. Now, they never got to see combat because by the time they got to where they were going, the war was already over. But needless to say, uh, Andrew Jackson appreciated those Tennessee volunteers. And so later in 1815, he took advantage of those Tennessee volunteers and he put them to work in the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. And the Tennessee volunteers were an instrumental part in winning that battle. And then you may have heard about the Texas Revolution later in 1836 where Tennessee volunteers went to Texas and fought in the revolution. There were some 30,000 Tennessee volunteers who signed up to go to Texas and to fight against uh, the Mexican army and to win Texas's independence. You may have heard about the Battle of the Alamo. And uh, somebody by the name of Davy Crockett. Anybody ever heard of Davy Crockett? Davy, Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. Anybody remember that song? Okay, you're showing your age now. Yeah, Davy Crockett. Hey, does anybody know what my middle name is? Crockett. Yeah. So I, I grew up being teased a little bit about that. Uh, but I wore my coonskip, coonskin cap proudly in, back in the day. And uh, I was very willing to be associated with Davy Crockett. But Davy Crockett took 30 Tennessee volunteers to the Alamo. And most of them perished there in the battle that ensued. But that became the rallying cry of the Texas Independence War. And eventually that war was won and Texas became independent. Do you notice anything about these three instances? The War of 1812 the Battle of New Orleans, the Texas Revolution, all these things where the Tennessee volunteers volunteered for action. None of them were in Tennessee. The British did not invade Tennessee. They were invading over on the East Coast. The Battle of New Orleans, New Orleans isn't in Tennessee. The Texas Revolution... Texas is definitely not in Tennessee. It wouldn't fit. So the Tennessee volunteers signed up to help other people meet the goals that they were trying to meet in battle. Huh. That sounds a little bit like what the church is supposed to be like. Mike Chapman said, he's from City Church in Chattanooga, the church is the only institution in the world that exists for people who are not its members. We don't exist for us. We exist for people who are not yet part of us. We exist for the lost. We exist for those who don't yet know Jesus. In fact, it's really not about us. It's not about us. 
It's about reaching the lost. Hey, Luke chapter 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Jesus is concerned with the lost. In fact, he said that is the reason that he came. In Luke 19 verse 10, he he shows us that he came on a search and rescue mission. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So it's not about us. It's not about what we like and what we don't like. It's not about whether or not we like the music or don't like the music. It's not about whether or not we like that person sitting next to us or not. Now, you have to love them. You may not like them, but you have to love them. So why don't you just remind them, go ahead, take a moment and remind that person next to you, I love you. And if you like them too, say, I love you and I like you. Go ahead. You see, it's not really about us. It's about a larger mission. It's about a larger calling. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 22, he said, I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul said, it's not about me. I'm doing everything in my power to win people to Christ. It's not about my personal preferences. It's not about my personal comfort. It's about reaching those that aren't yet reached. Our mission statement here at Parkway is making disciples who make a difference. Making disciples who make a difference. Now, where do we get that mission statement from? Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And I'll start with verse 18. Verse 18 says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, this is Jesus speaking. And Jesus said, All authority in heaven and and on earth has been given to me. Wow, that's a powerful statement. Well, who gave Jesus that kind of authority? God the Father. And Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In fact, that's that's very similar to what He said in John chapter 20, verse 21, he said, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Wow. So, as the Father has given Jesus all authority in heaven and on earth, and he has sent Jesus to the earth, now Jesus is sending us. So I'd like to illustrate this for a moment. Uh, Can I have some volunteers? You get that, volunteers? Can I have some volunteers? Um, Cliff, can you come up and be a volunteer now that I've recruited you? (laughs) Sean, can you come up and be a volunteer now that I've recruited you? Corky, can you come up and be a volunteer now that I've recruited you? Yeah. All right. Okay. You, you, you just stand right here and you hold this. You ever held one of those before? Okay. All right. Sean, why don't you just come right over here? And Corky, you just come right over here. No, we're not throwing any passes today. We're doing handoffs. Handoffs. Okay. So, so here's, now I know that this is a crude illustration. But, and it's not, it's not crude because of who's involved in the illustration, but this is a crude illustration in terms of, you know, 
we're talking about God here, but this is just something for you to be able to have something to picture what God has done. So, so we're going we're gonna to pretend here that Cliff represents God the Father. That's good. He's, he's representing God the Father. And so, so now he is going to do a handoff to Sean. But before he does, let me tell you who Sean represents. Sean represents God the Son, Jesus, who has been given all authority in heaven and in earth. As the Father has, Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. So, so Cliff is going, is going to hand off the ball to Sean, and that's going to represent God the Father giving all authority in heaven and on earth to Jesus. But before he does that, let me also tell you what Cork, Corky represents. Now, Corky may be tiny, but he's mighty. Hey, at his last birthday, he did a handstand. Hey, this, this, don't, end, don't underestimate Corky. He can get the job done. He used to be one of those Navy guys. That's right. So, so Corky represents the church. Yeah. Corky represents the church. So, so Cliff is going to hand the ball off to Sean, representing God the Father, handing all authority in heaven on earth to Jesus. And then Jesus... Sean, is going to hand off the ball to Corky. Why? Because as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Who's you? Yeah, in the, in the original text, it's you plural, and so I take the liberty to say, y'all, as the Father has sent me, I am sending y'all. Or, you know, some local variations thereof, yuns, some of you New Yorkers, use guys, you know what I'm talking about. All right, so let's, let's are y'all ready? So this is going to be a, a double handoff. So we're going to have to stay behind the line of scrimmage. Okay. So right now, yeah, Teresa said she's getting ready to rush, so we better hurry. All right. So, so God the Father is going to hand it off to the Son. And the Son is going to hand it off to the church. Now, what does the church need to do with this football? Run. Run. Can you run? Yeah. Run. All right, let's give all three of these guys a, a good hand clap. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. That was great. I appreciate that, y'all. Yeah. So the church needs to run with what Jesus has already given to us. The Father has given all authority in heaven and on earth to the Son, and the Son has temporarily left the earth. You notice I said temporarily. He is coming back. Hello? He is coming back. So he, but he's temporarily left the ball in our hands. And so it's up to us now, through the power of the Holy Spirit that the Son has poured out after he ascended into heaven and sat down at the Father's right hand, he has poured out the Holy Spirit on all of us. 
And so when we receive that power, that power of the Holy Spirit, then we can run with the football. We can actually win the lost. We can actually make disciples. We can actually take up where Jesus left off before he left. We can be the playmakers. So, Matthew 28, let's go to verse 19. It says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. So how do we make disciples? Jesus told us there's two things you have to do. You have to win souls, and you have to teach disciples. You have to win souls. You have to baptize, and that represents winning them to Christ and taking them under our wing and walking them through through water baptism and through faith in Jesus. And then we have to teach. We have to teach all things whatsoever Jesus has commanded us. And so it's not just enough to, to just win somebody to Christ and say, hey, I got another notch in my belt. I led someone to Christ the other day. Yeah, well, where are they now? Did you leave them out in the middle of the road where they could be run over? Where are they now? You want them to Christ, and that's well and good. But our mission is not complete at that point. That is only the beginning of our mission. We need to make disciples who make a difference. We need people to grow up under us that will take our place. We need to make disciples who make disciples. Hello? We need to make disciples who rise up and take our place and make more disciples. Amen? So... Whenever we are watching a Tennessee game and someone who has taken the ball and run with it crosses over into the end zone, what do we yell? Touchdown! Touchdown! Well, that's good. But you don't stop the game Because somebody made a touchdown. The game is not over just because someone made a touchdown. That's just the beginning of what we need to do. Now, if a team never makes a touchdown, and I'm not going to make any comments about Tennessee right now, but if if a team never makes a touchdown... Are they really a team? Well, they may be a team, but they're not getting the job done. They're not reaching the goal. They're not being about their father's business. They're not making disciples who make a difference. So... The touchdown is only the beginning. It's not the end. It's only the beginning. And so whenever we win someone to Christ, we don't need to stop there. We need to make disciples who make other disciples. In other words, we need to make disciples who make a difference in other people's lives. Amen? Amen. Now, let's go back to the Alamo for a moment. The commander of the volunteers at the Alamo was Jim Bowie. Anybody ever heard of a Bowie knife? One of those gigantic 
knives. Jim Bowie was the commander of the volunteers. And when it got desperate and it looked like that they were surrounded, he sent out a letter requesting aid. And notice what he said. He said, the salvation of Texas depends in great measure on keeping the Alamo out of the hands of the enemy. And then he goes on to say, Colonel Neal and myself have come to the solemn resolution that we will rather die in these ditches than give it up to the enemy. We would rather die in these ditches than give it up to the enemy. God is looking for a church that has fierce determination. God is looking for a church who is willing to lay down their lives for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is looking for a church who is not just desiring comfort and comfort zones. You can't get in the end zone if you're always in the comfort zone. And you know what? There's not room in the stands for any more spectators. Well, there is, but the spectators are the great cloud of witnesses that have already gone before us. So unless you're wanting to cross over now, there's no room for you in the stands. You're either on the field, part of the team, or you're not. Well, pastor, I don't feel like there's anything that I can do Well, let me use a good East Tennessee terminology to say hogwash. As long as there is still breath in your body, you can pray for somebody. You can pray and intercede for the lost. You can pray and intercede for those who are involved in reaching out to the lost. You can pray for me, your pastor. You can pray for everybody who's heading up all the teams here at the church. You can pray for everybody who's heading up all the groups here at the church. You can pray for everybody who's doing the outreaches of the church. Hey, you can stay busy in prayer, and that is the most important job that you can do. Amen. But those of us that have healthy legs and can get around a little bit, we need to put action to our prayers. It doesn't mean we need to stop praying, but we need to put action to our prayers. It's like the Jewish rabbi that has visited here before, Jonathan Hausman. It's like he says, you've got to pray as though it all depends on God, and you've got to work as though it all depends on you. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? You've got to pray as though it all depends on God, but you've got to work as though it all depends on you. So we've got to be willing to put action to our prayers. The great cloud of witnesses is looking on. They're cheering us on. And they're excited about us moving forward, moving the ball forward. Now, how many of you know that once Corky gets the snap or gets the handoff, the other team just doesn't lay down and let him go wherever he wants? There's going to be some fight. There's going to be some resistance. There's going to be some defense. He's going to have to overcome some obstacles as he's running through to the end zone. And how many of you know 
that the enemy desires to stop the church. The enemy desires to stop us. The enemy wants to wipe us out, wants to nip us in the bud so that we do not accomplish what God wants us to do. But the enemy has already been defeated. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. What does that mean? They will not win. Hallelujah. I've read the back of the book, and I already know that we will win. Hallelujah. So the question is not about winning or losing. We win. The question is, are you going to get in the game? Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. I didn't play football in high school, but I played soccer. And I was the slowest person on the team. Now, you're not supposed to chuckle at that. And so I didn't get to see that much action. But every once in a while, when they would get one of those fast halfbacks that would get down the field too quickly and they would be scoring, and they needed to be stopped. I would come up to the coach, and I would say, put me in, coach. And he knew what I meant, because I wasn't fast, but I was willing to slide tackle. Now, those of you that aren't soccer buffs, you won't understand what a slide tackle is. But that's when you put your body down on the ground at a fast rate of speed. And as long as you touch the ball first, you can touch anything after that that you want to. And so the coach sometimes would say, all right, Morris, go in and shut him down. And I would go in and I would lay down. I would, get, I would get running as fast as I could, and then I would slide, and as long as I hit the ball first, I could hit the person second. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? But it was fun. It was a little fun. And, and, and so I would, I would wipe that person out in the process. Now, every once in a while, I missed the ball and just got the person. And that wasn't good because sometimes I, I would borderline get a yellow card and, and that was dangerous. But normally I got the ball first. I laid down sliding and I took out the enemy. It's when we lay down our lives in our fight with the enemy that God's victory can be manifested in us and through us when we don't care whether or not we will get back up again. When with reckless abandon, we lay down our lives for the sake and the cause of Jesus Christ. God's victory can be manifest in us and through us, and we can win. So the question is, who's willing today to be a volunteer? No, I'm not talking about football now or any other sport now. I'm talking about signing up for God's army, for God's kingdom. Who is willing to say, put me in, coach? That's what Isaiah said. 
well, I'm paraphrasing. He said, here am I. Send me. Put me in, coach. Even if it means leaving my comfort zone. Put me in, coach. Even if it means leaving my personal preferences. Put me in, coach, regardless of what the cost is. Put me in, coach. No matter what I've got to do, I will do it. Just put me in. Here am I, Lord. Send me. So now I'm going to ask us, If you don't mind, let's stand. And I know this is a little unusual today. But can we close today by asking who wants to be a volunteer in the Lord's army today? Who wants to be sent in the game? Who wants to say, yes, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be who you want me to be. I'll go where you want me to go. In fact, if you don't mind, those of you that can, if you want to say, I'm willing, Lord, I'm willing to be part of the team. Could we just all come up around the front and let's close in prayer down front here today. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Come on, let's sing that together. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Use me, Jesus. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Now I'd like to ask each one in his, his or her own way to hear the voice of the Lord today, crying out, Whom will I send and who will go for us? And I'm just going to ask each person in his or her own way to say, here am I. Send me. Put me in, coach. <laughs> Put me in, coach. I'm willing. I'm ready. I'm able. Here am I. Send me. Send me first to my family. Oh, God, help me to be an example to my family of Christ and His love. Send me to my extended family, I pray, as a witness and testimony of Jesus Christ. Send me to my neighbors and my friends. Send me to my classmates at school. 
Send me to those folks that work with me on the job. Send me, oh God, wherever you would desire for me to go. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Oh God, what I have may not be much, but I know it can multiply at your touch. So if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me.